All right, well, good morning, everybody. Uh, my thanks to Jim and Mike and others for helping out with the service this morning. I, I, I was thinking, um, I think it was uh, Donald Trump on the campaign trail referred to Jeb Bush as low energy uh, Jeb, I think is what it was. I feel like low energy Danny today. I, I am under the weather. And so uh, I'm trying to take it easy until uh, the message here this morning. And so uh, the Lord will see me through. I'm feeling better, uh, but just a little bit of residual low energy uh, after being a little bit uh, sick the last couple of days. And so um, anyway, just uh, thank you to the, to the men for their contributions. And we're also shorthanded with a couple of our deacons being out of town. And so uh, we're just really grateful for uh, all the ways that uh, the people in our church step up to serve and, and to help. And so uh, thank you uh, to all those who have helped. And uh, uh, looking forward to being in the Word with you again. Open your Bibles to Exodus chapter 8. <clears throat> Exodus chapter 8. We are making good progress through the book of Exodus. And we've covered a lot of ground with our friend Moses. Uh, he's taken us from the earliest days of Israel in the land of Egypt, 400 years earlier, up through the oppression of Israel by Pharaoh and the people of Egypt, to the attempts of Pharaoh to reduce the population of a people he deemed to be an unassimilated threat to Egypt. We've covered the circumstances of Moses' infancy and being rescued from the Nile by Pharaoh's daughter. We've seen how Moses was called by God unto salvation from Egypt when at the age of 40 years old, Moses turned his back on Egypt and the author of Hebrews says in Hebrews 11, 24 to 26, by faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Considering the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. We saw how Moses fled Egypt and settled in the land of Midian for another 40 years as a shepherd, uh, tending the flocks of his father-in-law, Jethro. The story slowed significantly as we spent time with Moses before the angel of the Lord in the midst of a burning bush. And lately, we've journeyed with Moses back to Egypt as God commissioned him to be his representative in order to bring about the deliverance of Israel from bondage in Egypt. Moses has come a long way personally since he was a weak and resistant man, but the Lord overcame his weaknesses and the strength of Yahweh is now in Moses' hands. Last week we studied, as, uh, we studied the plagues as a whole as well as the first miracle of Yahweh's strong arm, to, uh, his strong arm of judgment and deliverance, when Aaron stretched out his hand over the Nile, and he struck it so that the water turned to blood. This was a direct confrontation of the false religion and the idolatry of Egypt as they worshipped the Nile itself and had many gods associated with the great river. And by way of reminder and review, I just want to remind us of the purposes of the ten plagues that God brought against Egypt. We covered a, a number of different elements of all the plagues together last time. We covered several facets of the plagues as a whole, but as we cover the other plagues, I think a review of the purposes of the plagues will be helpful. First, the plagues publicly displayed the power of God. The Word of God brought powerful consequences for disobedience, and they showed that God is powerful to overwhelm the resistance of God and the power of Satan. Second, the plagues served as a judgment upon Pharaoh and Egypt. God visits His people with compassion and salvation, but God also visits the wicked in His wrath and judgment. Third, the plagues were given as a judgment upon the gods and demons of Egypt. Numbers chapter 33 verse 4 says exactly that, as God revealed the impotence of Egypt's so-called gods. Fourth, 
The plagues established Yahweh as God, high above all so-called gods, even Pharaoh himself, the most powerful man on earth, and a so-called god over Egypt. Fifth, the plague served as a public warning to other nations who might dare to curse Israel. God had promised in the Abrahamic covenant to bless those who bless you and to curse those who curse you. And Egypt had cursed Israel. And so these other nations are to be warned that those who come against God's people will have God come against them. God put the world on notice of what it meant to come against the covenant people of God. And finally, number six, the plagues were designed to test Israel's allegiance and to stimulate their worship. And so we come to our text this morning. It's Exodus chapter 8. Let's take a look at verses 1 through 15. Exodus chapter 8, beginning in verse 1. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go to Pharaoh and say to him, Thus says the Lord, Let my people go, that they may serve me. But if you refuse to let them go, behold, I will smite your whole territory with frogs. The Nile will swarm with frogs, which will come up and go into your house and into your bedroom and on your bed and into the houses of your servants and on your people and into your ovens and into your kneading bowls. So the frogs will come up on you and your people and all your servants. And the Lord said to Moses, say to Aaron, stretch out your hand with your staff over the rivers, over the streams and over the pools and make frogs come up on the land of Egypt. So Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. The magicians did the same with their secret arts, making frogs come up on the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, Entreat the Lord that he remove the frogs from me and from my people, and I will let the people go, that they may sacrifice to the Lord. Moses said to Pharaoh, The honor is yours to tell me. When shall I entreat for you and your servants and your people that the frogs be destroyed from you and your houses that they may be left only in the Nile? And he said, Tomorrow. So he said, May it be according to your word that you may know that there is no one like the Lord our God. The frogs will depart from you and your houses and your servants and your people. They will be left only in the Nile. Then Moses and Aaron went out from Pharaoh, and Moses cried to the Lord concerning the frogs which he had inflicted upon Pharaoh. The Lord did according to the word of Moses, and the frogs died out of the houses, the courts, and the fields. So they piled them in heaps, and the land became foul. But when Pharaoh saw that there was relief, he hardened his heart and did not listen to them, as the Lord had said. The plague of the bloody water has ended after seven days. The water of the river has returned to normal. Egypt is drinking fresh water again, and they feel a sense of relief that they can get their water more easily like they used to. And so life has returned to normal after a great blow from Yahweh against Egypt and their worship of the Nile gods. And we don't know how long it was after the seven days of bloody water that the Lord spoke to Moses again in verse 1. I get the impression that there was some time between the first plague and the second, but not very much time. Maybe a couple of days, but it doesn't say. Pharaoh had been hardened by the first experience of God's power, and so Yahweh comes again to Moses, and he tells him to go before Pharaoh once again. And the old is the new new. That's one of my favorite phrases, right? That's one of the things that we are seeking to consider here in our church that the old paths are actually the new paths. Go to Pharaoh and say to him, it's the old message, it's the same message, let my people go that they may serve me. The issue at hand is who has the right? Who has the authority over worship? And we've noted before that whoever has the right to establish the terms of worship also has the right and authority to command obedience over every area of life. And so, when governments deny the assembling of God's people in a place and according to the terms of God's Word, then that government is also asserting its absolute authority over every area of life. It is no small thing when the governments overstep their God-ordained authority. And we see... This from Pharaoh. 
who regulated every detail of life over God's people. He determined what kind of work was to be done. He owned their bodies and claimed the authority to do to them whatever he pleased. And he was pleased to beat them and to make their jobs very difficult. And we need to remember that God was coming to deal with the oppression and the affliction, the harsh treatment of his people, and the way he delivered them was through an appeal that centered on worship. Pharaoh's totalitarian regime that controlled the lives of God's people from the womb to the tomb was a direct assault against the sovereignty of God. His authority over all life to be served and to be worshipped according to His Word. And God tells Moses to go before Pharaoh once again and to reiterate the demand of Yahweh. I am to be served, Pharaoh, not you. The demand of God to the world is to relinquish your control and let my people serve me. There is only one God in this world. And everyone who does not acknowledge Him is clamoring for His throne. You get that? There is one God in this world, and everyone who does not acknowledge Him is clamoring for His throne. Man wants to be autonomous. He wants to be his own God and to rule their own lives. And when they gain positions of authority without the restraint of the fear of God and the restraint of God's law, they want to rule the lives of others as they demand the worship of service. Evil governments swallow up everything so that they are seen as ultimate and the people exist to serve them. But the message of salvation is also a message of judgment to those who refuse to accept the one true and living God. Egypt was in the process of being laid waste and Pharaoh couldn't see it. He was blinded by his sin and he was drunk with his own power. And every time governments squeeze harder, things get worse. When freedom under God is not respected, life gets harder for that nation. For God's ways and His laws are indeed true freedom. But when government seeks to replace God, it only gets worse and life gets harder. And so, verse 2, the Lord issues a threat to Pharaoh. If you continue to refuse my authority to have my people serve me according to my commands, behold, I will smite your whole territory with frogs. This is a conflict of religion. But we understand that it is all about who has the right to command every area of life. And when Israel is delivered in order to serve the Lord, The worship He commands includes His laws that affect every area of life, don't they? But God's law is a law of liberty. While man's laws that do not correspond to the law of God, though they amount to abuse and slavery. Now last week we saw that Moses came before Pharaoh in direct conflict with Egyptian false religion. He confronted Pharaoh at the the banks of the Nile, interrupting what was a planned worship service to the God of the Nile. And as we've mentioned earlier, these plagues were a direct assault on the gods of Egypt. In their mythology, the Egyptians believed in and worshipped froggy deities. For instance, these are difficult to pronounce, K-H-N-U-M. Yeah, K'num was among the first Egyptian gods, and he was depicted as having the face of a frog. Also having horns, he had the body of a man. And he was seen as the source of the Nile. He brought the yearly flooding and and that was so vital to the region's agriculture. And then you have the goddess, again, I don't know how you pronounce these things, H-E-Q-T, We'll just say het. 
She was depicted as a frog-like figure, and she was considered to be the goddess of fertility. Women would carry around or wear amulets, which are objects of superstition as a charm against evil. And so Egyptian women would wear these kinds of good luck charms depicting a frog-like figure that represented this goddess who would keep them from evil things that would negatively affect their fertility. And of course, the matter of fertility is extremely important. We won't get deep into it now, but societies that don't value fertility and having many children as a value and virtue, eventually they wither and they die. This is happening all over the world now as nations who have not valued having many children are actually getting taken over. I believe it's France that is going to be taken over by the Muslims without a shot, simply by birth rate. And we recall that this was a matter of jealousy and it was a matter of competition and a source of great concern in Egypt between them and the Israelites. Why? Because the Israelites... We're having a major baby boom. They were were multiplying greatly. God was blessing them with many children. And it was becoming, it was being seen as a threat to the land of Egypt. Interesting how that happens. And God had blessed the Hebrews with with this baby boom as a result of his promise to the patriarchs. And all the while, the Egyptians and Pharaoh, they took notice. And we talked about that earlier in the book when Pharaoh sought to put a stop to the population increase of the Jews. But the Egyptian women looked to the frog goddess in order to bless and protect their fertility. How sad. How sad it is that women burdened by barrenness or simply hopeful for more children turned to the entirely wrong place for help. Instead of turning to the God of Israel, the true and living God who created the universe, the one who is sovereign over the womb, they prayed to a make-believe frog goddess. And just a word to any among you who may be struggling with barrenness or infertility, Turn to the one who is in control. Trust in him that he has a plan and a purpose for you and pour your heart out to him and cry out to him for there is no other place to turn. Make sure that you turn to the true and living God and not to superstitions, not to, not, not to any other thing in this world, but rather to the God who is in control of the womb. Now, it is obvious why a frog would be connected with pagan hopes for fertility. Depending on the species and environment, a frog lays thousands of eggs at a time. One source identified that some frogs can lay up to 30,000 eggs in one clutch. And so, the Egyptians developed a mythology of fertility also connected with the Nile itself. Remember, as I mentioned last week, the, the, Nile, uh, the, the Nile was a source of many uh, uh, false gods and idols for the Egyptians. And so they were hoping to have children by the power of this frog goddess. Now, I was asked this week, why was a frog the thing they, th- they turned to for worship? There are lots of creatures that multiply, multiply greatly. Why a frog? And well, the reason is because of its connection to the Nile and to the gods associated with it. Much of their religion was centered in the Nile and a mythology developed around frogs. And if you think about it, it's as good as any other creature. A couple of quick notes on frogs here, as I'm sure you're aware. We often use the word frog to describe the category of amphibians that include the distinction of frogs and toads. We often even make the mistake, we see a frog when it's actually a toad, but we all know what we mean by that, right? Even when we use the word frog as a kind of catch-all word for this type of creature. But we have come to distinguish, of course, between the two biologically. 
And our school-age children can probably tell us the difference, right? If I were to ask these students here today, what's the difference between frogs and toads? wonder how you would do on the test. Frogs and toads have different legs. They have different skin, different color, and one is more hoppy and the other is more crawly. And they have a difference in their environments they live in. While both are connected to the water for their reproductive life and tadpole stages, toads live on the land while frogs stick close to the water. Now, I looked up the the amphibian species of Egypt, and at least in modern times, they've identified two species of frogs and five species of toads in Egypt. I'm assuming these are the same ones that would be around back then. We're dealing with potentially seven species of toads and frogs. And I believe that when God sent a plague of frogs on Egypt, they likely included both frogs and toads because of the invasion of the land. They were everywhere, and likely a variety of species that had a population explosion. Predominantly, I would imagine that toads were those that invaded much of the land, but everywhere you would go to escape, you would find a a toad or a frog somewhere. But I think the word frog is still an apt description of the amphibious creatures that plagued Egypt even though toads, of course, played a large role. It's basically the same thing, and I'm not aware of a distinction. I'm not aware of a distinction in the Hebrew language between the two, a frog or a toad, and so that's not a problem for us. We understand what we mean when when it says frogs. And God said the frogs or the toads will be upon the whole territory of Egypt. Verse 3, the Nile will swarm with frogs, and they will come up and go into your house. And notice that the Nile, the great source of blessing, and the object of so much Egyptian worship, would be where the nightmare would originate from. How appropriate for false gods, the the source of their hope, the source of their worship, would actually be the place from which their nightmare would crawl. And the Lord continues, they will go into your house and into your bedroom and on your bed, and into the houses of your servants, and on your people, and into your ovens, and into your kneading bowls. The country would literally be crawling with frogs. Can you imagine it? Can you picture it in your mind's eye? Now, if you are like me, the sound of frogs croaking at night in the distance is kind of soothing, kind of enjoyable. Hearing a few frogs serenade each other in the dark outside or at the edge of the water when we're camping is a pleasant sound. It's different, of course, than the song of a bird, but there is a beauty to its nighttime ribbiting. But stop for a minute and imagine your bedroom at night filled with croaking toads. They're not off in the distance romantically highlighting the night air. There are dozens, there, there's dozens or hundreds of them even moving and yelling all over your room. Imagine, ladies, laying in bed, trying to go to sleep. It's dark. It's a warm Egyptian night and you feel a clammy, bumpy thing touch your leg. And at first you're grossed out by the clammy, wart-infested foot of your husband, but then you realize the toads are in your bed. (laughs) And I can imagine the shrieks and the screams of women all throughout Egypt as the frogs are in their beds. And then she goes to grab one and to toss it across the room in a sudden fit of get it out of here, right? And as soon as she grabs it, what happens when she picks it up? Oh no! Gross, right? Now she has to get up to wash wash her hands. She stepped on one on the way to the wash bin that thankfully doesn't have bloody water in it anymore. 
And there's no light switches and bright LED lights to see really well. And so the frogs are a living nightmare because nobody is getting any sleep. And remember, with frogs in your bed, fertility is the furthest thing from anybody's mind. (laughs) The next day, after a sleepless night with frogs and toads everywhere, the women go to the kitchen to make some breakfast. And the frogs are in the dishes. The toads are in the food. They have found their way into the oven. You're constantly dealing with frogs and their filth all over your house. Then the husband, who hasn't slept all night with that incessant croaking, leaves the house and his wife with all the frogs and he goes to work. But verse 13 says that the frogs were in the courts and they were in the fields. It didn't matter if you were a farmer, a nobleman, or some kind of tradesman, the frogs were everywhere. Couldn't escape them. And in essence, the country was shut down. Egypt was overrun in a devastating way. Look at verses 5 and 6. Then the Lord said to Moses, say to Aaron, stretch out your hand with your staff over the rivers, over the streams, and over the pools, and make frogs come up on the land of Egypt. So Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. Once again, the formula is the Lord speaks with Moses. He is doing for Moses exactly as he told him he would. He was teaching Moses what he was to say and what he was to do. And then he is instructed to have Aaron stretch out his staff so that the word of the Lord would come to pass. The job of the minister is to first receive the word of the Lord, then to pass it on faithfully and be careful to obey the Lord, and His word will accomplish its purposes. Moses and Aaron in and of themselves didn't have power. The preacher, the minister, doesn't have power in and of himself. The power is in the word of God. The job of the preacher is to be faithful. The job of the preacher is to receive the message of the Lord and then to deliver it faithfully and to do what God has commanded. And from there, the Word of the Lord will do His work. Martin Luther was struck by the power of God to bring about change and noted that it wasn't any power within himself that changed the world. It was God's Word that did it all. There was no power in the staff. There was nothing inherent in Moses and Aaron. They were just ordinary men, and they were like you and me. I want you to look now at verse 12. Then Moses and Aaron went out from Pharaoh, and Moses cried to the Lord concerning the frogs which he had inflicted upon Pharaoh. The frogs did not come up out of the Nile by the power and authority of Moses and Aaron. The frogs came up because God determined that they would. He communicated His Word to His servant. His servant obeyed, and the Word of the Lord brought forth the miraculous judgment of frogs, and it would be the Word of the Lord that would take them away. The power is in God. And He often chooses to work through the agency of faithful people. And if you want to see great things in your life, If you want to see great things in this world, receive the Word of the Lord through the Scripture. Be careful to obey it and watch God's Word do its work through you. Ordinary men, ordinary women submitted to the Word of God, seeking to obey it. Being patient then to watch for the power of God to work. Now those who deny the Word of God have sought to explain away God's miracles as they are called in chapter 3, verse 20, and to chalk them up to natural phenomenon sourced in nature itself. Some have suggested that the frogs came as a byproduct of a significant volcanic eruption in Greece that would have affected the acidity of the water, causing the frogs to look for better habitat. And you end up with a population explosion all of a sudden in Egypt. Another attempt to deny the miraculous is the red algae theory. 
once again, where it only appeared to be red uh, due to a heavy algae bloom. It wasn't really blood, it was algae in their, in their hypothesis. It killed the fish in the Nile and causing the frogs then to leave the water in search of better water and food, and that's why they ended up all over the country. But my personal favorite excuse for why the plague of frogs may have happened apart from the supernatural power of God, drum roll please, climate change. No joke. Now, they never said man-made climate change, but it was, again, climate change was the argument. And I love how they grabbed onto a contemporary concept and phrase and projected it onto an ancient event. So let me just quote the article for you. Quote, Climate change would need to have occurred to some degree for the volcanic eruption or red algae theory to prove accurate. Research on stalagmites in 2010 suggested that there might have been a dry period toward the end of Pharaoh Ramses II's rule. If these climate changes had occurred, it could have sparked the growth of burgundy blood algae. At this point, however, there is no scientific proof that the frog plague took place as described in Exodus. End quote. Well, in their mind, one, uh, one just guesses is as good as another. And so notice the presupposition is that miracles don't happen by the power of God. And so we'll just take zero scientific proof in order to prove that a non-scientific event of supernatural power didn't happen as described in Exodus. It would be more funny if it wasn't so sad. Look now at verse 7. The magicians did the same with their secret arts, making frogs come up on the land of Egypt. Hmm. Notice again, the Janus and Jambres, the Egyptian soothsayer priests, who were connected to the power of Satan, were able to make frogs appear in Egypt. The power of darkness is real power, but it is limited. It is only able to do evil and not good. And Jesus spoke about the miracles He did, which were miracles of healing and miracles of mercy, including the freeing of people from power of demonic slavery. But his accusers, Jesus' accusers, the Jerusalem scribes in Mark chapter 3, accused Jesus of doing his works by the power of Beelzebul, the ruler of the demons. And Jesus said in Mark chapter 3, beginning in verse 24, if the kingdom is divided against itself, the kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. If Satan has risen up against, against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but he is finished. But no one can enter the strong man's house and plunder his property unless he first binds the strong man, and then he will plunder his house. Jesus was saying, how can I be working for Satan and demonstrate satanic power if what I'm doing is works of healing and miracles of demonic exorcism? And I bring this up at this point to reiterate what I said last week about the very limited power of those who are described here in Exodus as accessing the secret arts. Notice that they can only do harm. They can only bring judgment upon themselves. And they have no power to work the works of God in reversing the curse. Did you notice this? What were they able to do? They were able to bring forth some frogs. The power of Satan, which is power, only does evil. It only brings forth judgment and destruction. And so all the Egyptian magicians can do is they can only make it worse. They can only bring further judgment upon themselves by making what? More frogs. They do not have any power to save or to deliver. The works of Satan's servants only make more frogs. Jesus said, I can't be doing the works of Satan by delivering people from the power of Satan. That would mean that Satan, who builds his kingdom only through evil, destruction, and death, would be undoing his work by empowering Jesus to do righteousness, 
to heal, and to grant life. And Jesus said to consider the works of Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit as being from the works of Satan is to give up on any forgiveness and salvation. You must believe the truth of God's Word and recognize that it is the power of God in Christ and by the Holy Spirit that relief and salvation comes. The servants of Pharaoh could only bring more frogs, but they were powerless to make it stop. Isn't that interesting? They couldn't make it stop. No matter the pleas, no matter the cries from the people, Make it stop as, they, as the Egyptians turned to their leaders, as they tur- turned to their religious experts. They couldn't do anything about it. They were powerless. Look at, now at verse 8. Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, Entreat the Lord that He remove the frogs from me and from my people, and I will let the people go that they may sacrifice to Yahweh. Pharaoh takes a bite of humble pie, And he calls for Moses and Aaron and pleads with them, make it stop. He prays to Moses, ask Yahweh. What was that? I thought Pharaoh didn't know who Yahweh was. But we're only at plague number two. And Pharaoh now knows who Israel's God is, right? Do you remember what he said before? Who is this Yahweh? I do not know this God. And now in plague number two, we have a long way to go. In plague number two, it's please ask your God to make it stop. Ask Yahweh to remove the frogs and I will let the people go so that they may sacrifice and worship Yahweh. It's amazing what a little suffering and a little sleep deprivation will do to a person. And what's interesting is that we don't know how many days the frogs were covering the land, how many sleepless nights of loud croaking, how many shrieks and screams did it take for Mrs. Pharaoh to finally say, make it stop. Look now at verses 9 through 11. Moses said to Pharaoh, the honor is yours to tell me. When shall I entreat for you and your servants and your people that the frogs be destroyed from you and your houses, that they may be left only in the Nile? And he said, Tomorrow. So he said, May it be according to your word that you may know that there is no one like the Lord our God. The frogs will depart from you and your houses and your servants and your people. They will be left only in the Nile. Why would Moses handle it this way? Pharaoh, you pick the time. Whenever you want this to stop, we'll make it stop. You agreed to let Israel go, so the honor is yours. Just know that there is no one like Yahweh. Moses gave Pharaoh the opportunity to have some of his honor as a national leader restored, but he was to know that there is no one like Yahweh. He has the power over you, your nation, and He demonstrated it by flooding you with frogs and by taking them away just as quickly. And notice verse 13, that He didn't make the frogs just go away. God made them die. And the Egyptians would have to clean them up. Heaps and heaps of dead frogs, verse 14, and the smell had to be horrible. But notice... Verse 15. But when Pharaoh saw that there was relief, he hardened his heart and did not listen to them as the Lord had said. False repentance is a sad phenomenon. Submission and belief appear to be genuine at first. They say the right things. They acknowledge the truth. They recognize who God is. They make good commitments. They appear for a little while, but when things go back to normal, when the crisis in their life that exposed themselves and the truth, when that is over and life returns to normal, then their true colors 
shine through. Pharaoh responded to the trouble of the frogs by saying the right things, didn't he? But it didn't last long. For when life returned to normal, when he was able to get a, good, a few good nights of sleep, when his wife stopped pressuring him to do something, when his people relaxed after the stress of the plague, when the economy got back on track, then his own pride welled up within him once again, and he did not listen to them as the Lord had said. That means that he did not let Israel go as he committed to. Instead, he went back on his word. And my friends, it is very important to have a soft heart toward God and His Word. If you are a professing believer, listen, God's people also struggled with hardening their heart also. Listen to Hebrews chapter 3, verses 12-15. through 15. Take care, brethren, that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. But encourage one another day after day as long as it is still called today so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm until the end. It must be something that is true in your heart that lasts so that you persevere. That we hold fast to not just simply praying a prayer, making a superficial commitment. But in reality, it is that which needs to be held on to firm till the very end. While it is said, today if you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoked Me. Each of us needs to do heart inventory to make sure that we are not a false professor. That we are not just a fair weather Christian. That as long as things are going well, as long as there's money in my wallet, as long as there's health in my body, as long as there isn't a crisis in the land, well then I'll be a Christian. Then I'll follow the Lord. But when things get tough, when persecution comes, when it is no longer popular to do so, when at risk of your own health and your own freedom and your own life, will you then also follow the Lord? Will you then also do what He commands you to do? Will you trust and obey? Or will you harden your heart and no longer care about the words that you previously spoke? Instead, we are called by the Word of God to persevere in our faith firm to the end. And let us not be like Pharaoh, who when there was relief, hardened his heart and did not listen to Moses and Aaron and to the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Our God, when you come in judgment, it is severe. It causes pain and suffering and hardship, sleeplessness, filth. We see Your great power. It is supernatural power. It is not explained by ordinary natural means, but instead the God who created the world stepped in and performed Your mighty work. Your work of judgment against the king of Egypt and his people who had oppressed and who had come against your covenant people. Lord, may that stand as a warning to the rest of the world as well that those who come against your people will have the wrath of God come against them. And Lord, we pray that your people might find patience and endurance that we might actually trust You through every circumstance, knowing that You have purposes and intentions for all of us and that You have a desire 
to sanctify your people through your word and through the various trials that we go through. And we pray, Lord, that you would cause us to look to you in faith. May we be soft-hearted towards you and your word. We ask that you would work in us your truth and cause us to walk in your ways. pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.